And, you know, now we can write out the equation for, you know, the incremental part or the incremental, uh, an increment of plastic strain tensor. Remember, it's, it's now, we determined that it's lambda Sij. Well, we know Sij, we, we solved for it before, right? So it's, uh, for this particular case, right? So if you don't know where this comes from, just look back in your notes. I mean, we, we found this before, again, because here we're talking about the specific case where you know, it's, it's perfect plasticity. And so this locate, this is why. Okay, so basically, I don't know if you remember, but when we defined the yield function, which is like square root 3j2 minus y equals zero, right? And we said that this guy either has to be less than zero, in which case the deformation is elastic, or it has to be identically zero, in which case the deformation is plastic, okay? And so what that means geometrically, if we look at our, our drawing up here, is that the state of stress is either inside the yield surface, in which case it's elastic, or it's sitting on the yield surface, in which case it's plastic. So it cannot be out here, outside the yield surface. And in the situation that it is, we use this flow rule and this multiplier to return it to the yield surface. So one thing you can think of, one, one thing, you know, geometrically that you can think of this guy is it's, it's sort of the, the, the penalization of the stress to get it back onto the yield surface. And in that um, kind of thought process, it, it's very much analogous to a Lagrange multiplier. So if you've ever seen in other, any other mechanics or optimization classes, uh, you know, have you ever heard of a Lagrange multiplier? Anybody ever heard of a Lagrange multiplier? So it's, you know, it's often used in optimization or penalty methods, and, it, and it's sort of, it, that's the same role it's playing here, right? It's playing the role of a penalization parameter or a Lagrange multiplier to get this inadmissible state of stress that would be outside the yield surface back onto the yield surface, okay? And so this lambda can be thought of as sort of this, this distance, this penalty distance to get the state of stress back onto the yield surface, okay? But in this case, in the, in the way that we've written it, you know, this is an incremental change in lambda, and because we're assuming the flow is perfectly plastic, lambda will never change because the yield surface will never change. It'll always be a circle of fixed radius, okay? And we'll see a case in a minute where that's not true, okay? It won't be a, a circle of fixed radius. It'll, it'll be a circle, but it can change radius due to some physical mechanism, okay? And so, in this case, it's a circle of fixed magnitude, and so there is no, you know, delta lambda is just a constant, right? And because we've sort of, the way we've written the flow rule here, flow rule here the actual magnitude is, is carried in the deviatoric stress, then in this case, it's just one, right? This, there's no change in lambda in this case. And so the, the plastic strain that should be P, is, is just, um, the plastic strain is, is just what you see written here, plastic strain <laughs> tensor. So with that and with Hooke's law then, we can write that E11 is equal to Y over E minus E11P and that, if we, you know, implies that E11P is equal to E11 minus Y over E, okay? And um, 
by the way, if it's not obvious, this is E11P. So therefore, this is minus E11P over 2, as is this, minus E11P over 2. Right. That should be, you see that the y over 3 appears in all the cases. So if I just, if, if this is E11P, then the rest of them are just E11P divided by 2. Okay. Uh, so anyway, now I have an expression for E11P, and through Hooke's law I can say that E22 is equal to minus nu over E y minus one-half E11P, which is equal to minus nu over E y minus one-half E11 minus one over E. Right? And so this, because remember I said this guy was prescribed, right? It's like a boundary condition, so you know you can use 20% as an example. We're going to do a uniaxial tension test to 20%, and then so in that scenario, the the e the epsilon 22 component of the stress is fully defined, right? So if we know we know the boundary condition, we can prescribe. We know the entire stress tensor, right? And then the same thing, likewise, for E33. It's the same equation. <coughs> so, in this case, you know, we assumed, we made some assumptions at the very beginning. We had uniaxial stress test, and we had perfect plasticity. And under those assumptions, we could sort of fully, fully define the stress tensor and the strain tensor. Yeah? Is the, uh, the E11 equals Y over E minus E2P over left, uh, Y over E equals Y over E plus Y over E minus Is that correct the way you translated that over? Because you add the E11 over E11P over Sorry. It should be plus, right? It's, remember, th this comes from the additive decomposition, right? So this is the elastic strain. E11 elastic plus the plastic, right? So we, we make the assumption that the total strain can be decomposed into an elastic part and a plastic part. So the elastic strain is governed by Hooke's law, and, and then the plastic part we, we infer from this. Okay? 